This is the Illiger Ionic Touch, but you may also know this laptop as the Schenker Vision 15 or the XPG Xenia XE Gaming as these laptops are based off the Intel NUC M15 reference design. Right off the bat, it looks a lot more like a MacBook Pro clone, uh, kind of, you know, thin and light that does look like it's more suited for light workloads and just you know, word processing, but that is exactly where this laptop has absolutely surprised me with its combination of Core i7 and Intel's new XE graphics, pulling out some interesting results, even when gaming. <laughs> Let me tell you about it and more with my deep dive review on the Intel NUC M15, aka Elegir Ionic Touch. The M15 is supposed to represent Intel's vision of the perfect Tiger Lake thin and light, and as such it carries an Intel Core i7-1165G7, a 4-core 8-thread processor built on Intel's 10 nanometer process. Along with this processor is Intel's new Iris Xe graphics, which should prove to be quite a sizable improvement over their previous Intel HD graphics. The variant that I have here comes with 16GB of DDR4-4266 RAM and uh, that is sorted on RAM, so make sure that you get enough to begin with because <laughs> that ain't changing. There is also a Samsung PM9A1 512GB PCIe 4.0 NVMe SSD here, an Intel AX201 Wi-Fi chip, a 15.6-inch 1080p BOE panel that is purportedly 100% sRGB at 60Hz, and a 73Wh battery. Being somewhat in the Ultrabook category, the laptop itself is pretty slim and light at just 1.66kg and sizes in at 355mm wide, 230mm deep and 14.9mm thick. The power brick itself is pretty light as well with a USB-C head and weighs in at 380 grams, is made by FSP and delivers 65 watts as per the USB PD standard. Build quality and construction wise, the laptop is built quite well with a fully machined silver aluminum body and generally does remind you of a MacBook Pro. The only sign of Illegear branding on this laptop is on the top and uh, onto the ports over on the left, a USB-C Thunderbolt 4 port that can be used for charging, a full-sized HDMI port and a USB 3.2 10GB Type-A port. And over on the right, there is another one of those Thunderbolt 4 ports that also can be used for charging, which means that you can charge the laptop on either side, which is awesome. Another USB 3.2 10GB Type-A port and a 3.5mm headphone and microphone combo jack, which is nice to see. All ventilation is on the rear which goes below the screen once the laptop is open and the front of the laptop actually has an LED that only seems to light up when the laptop is on and the lid is closed or when the laptop is charging. Bottom has bottom firing speakers on both sides and perforations down the center for ventilation and if you're interested in having a look inside your laptop to upgrade it, well, um, I hope you have a Torx T6 screwdriver handy because there are 7 of them holding the back in place. It is a bit hard to see but there is only one heat pipe to handle the 1165G7 with uh, its Intel XE graphics and two fans on each side. I did say that you could open up the laptop to upgrade it but the options are pretty limited to just swapping out the uh, NVMe SSD and the Wi-Fi chip. The laptop has a very nice smooth yet firm hinge that easily passes my one-handed opening test and we're greeted by this glass-coated 15.6 inch IPS display with pretty minimal bezels that honestly look pretty good due to its color accuracy rating but it's also a touchscreen which I mean I don't really use touchscreen laptops all that much, I don't really see the appeal in it, the 60Hz uh, only refresh can be a bit jittery when scrolling, but I guess it's pretty cool and someone may like it, but there was this little issue that I had where if I was playing a uh, YouTube video, I closed the laptop and carried it around, I could actually get some weird phantom touches that would otherwise uh, pause or resume the video or, you know, scrub it. SSD claiming up to 3180 megabytes per second read and 2960 megabytes per second write speed sequentially and it's ideally used in high performance gaming PCs or 
Otherwise, it does get decently bright and dark, but uh, let me know if you guys would like me to invest in some tools to measure the display brightness of, you know, these displays in nits. There is also a webcam above that is capable of Windows Hello functionality, which is kind of cool. So it automatically wakes up and unlocks when it sees your face, keeps it alive when you're looking at it, and also dims it and locks it when you're not. But the webcam itself, I mean, <laughs> look at it. I think me showing off this video itself should answer everything that you need to know about this webcam. It's incredibly noisy, it's got pretty bad dynamic range, the resolution looks absolutely horrible, but at least the audio isn't half bad. In short, this looks like a VGA camera out of the early 2000s, and it's just garbage tier. There's another row of intake vents right above the keyboard, which is useful if you decide to use the laptop on a pillow or a bed that would absolutely choke the bottom intake. The keyboard is a chiclet style keyboard. I would have loved to see a full sized one, especially given the size. Uh, they're backlit quite nicely and evenly with three brightness levels, including off. But unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be an option to turn off the camera. Given that I've gotten used to at least having some kind of LED to let you know that the camera is in use and the ability to disable the camera outright on the keyboard, this definitely feels a bit backwards to me on the privacy department, though I doubt anyone can actually see anything given how terrible the webcam quality is. As for the typing experience, it's definitely one of the better keyboards that I've used on a Windows laptop, though of course I do still prefer a MacBook for typing. The touchpad is made of glass with a matte-like finish and is quite big and satisfying to use with nice tactile clicks. You can also tap the top left corner to lock the touchpad which kind of reminds me of Tongfang laptops, so I do wonder if that is who the OEM of these machines is. We finally get to the software side of things, and the NUC M15 is pretty bare bones with only two pre-installed apps. The Intel NUC Software Studio allows you to do very basic monitoring of your system while allowing you to change some Windows Hello settings, and Intel Graphics Command Center that allows you to do some pretty basic screen recording, color adjustments, and interestingly enough, set the power profile of the XE GPU with a higher number giving a uh, lower display quality. Before we move on onto the benchmarks, there are two things that I'd like to cover. Firstly, I installed the Intel driver and support assistant. And if you have this laptop, you should as well as it helped me to download newer BIOS versions and display drivers for this laptop and install them. Secondly, I ran into issues I normally would not have expected to run into with this laptop. Okay, so check this out. The first, uh, is a YouTube playback problem whenever I'm on either Microsoft's Edge or Google Chrome. As you can see, the playback of the video looks totally fine right now, but the moment that I try to enlarge it and watch closely, as the button disappears, it turns um, into a slideshow, a buggy <laughs> slideshow. And this occurred whenever I had anything drawn over on the surface or anything. This is obviously very annoying, but I still managed to fix it by disabling Intel's uh, panel self-refresh technology. It's like you can see here in their graphics command center app. So you just turn that one off. So given that this is not a very good out of the box experience, and you know, given that the XE graphics is kind of new, early adopter issues are to be expected, but I don't think that most normal people would have been able to figure this one out. The other is also an early adopter issue, this time to do with Media Player Classic Home Cinema. Whenever I'm watching anything that renders subtitles over the video, like, you know, for example, 
anime or just normal subtitles, rainbow glitches and artifacts would appear around the subtitles, like so, and the only way that I was able to fix that was by installing a uh, matte VR renderer and setting that as the default renderer. Again, it's just really annoying. I'm sure that they will be fixed in time, but it's just something that you have to keep in mind if you're interested in getting this laptop as they, well, there may be other uh, early adopter issues that I didn't know of and didn't run into yet. Getting into the benchmark, starting with the CPU in Cinebench R20, the 1165G7 pulled out some pretty impressive numbers at about 2300, putting it slightly behind Intel's 10750H from last generation that I tested at nearly the same power level even though that chip is a 6-core 12-thread part and of course the 1165G7 being a 4-core 8-thread processor. The single core performance of this chip definitely helps to narrow that gap with the single core numbers alone killing the competition at over 560 points. The blender results were equally as good with the 1165G7 coming in at 6 minutes and 50 seconds putting it behind the 10750H although the gap this time was larger. I also like running Cinebench R23 on the 10 minute throttle test, <laughs> you know, well, a test for any throttling, and I mean, this is kind of to be expected, but yes, there was throttling at the beginning where the CPU hits its uh, PL2 limit of 50 watts, uh, hits a thermal throttle, and later when it's stabilizing at its uh, PL1 limit of 40 watts, where it was still a mix of thermal and power. This meant that starting out, it hit about 4GHz before instantly starting to throttle down and finally settling to about 3.5 to 3.6GHz. No one getting this laptop is obviously going to do any kind of serious gaming on it, um, but that doesn't mean that it's incapable of it. <laughs> in fact, the Intel XE graphics within is the closest Intel has gotten to making a gaming GPU. In the TimeSpy benchmark, the 96 Execution Unit XE GPU got some pretty respectable numbers. <laughs> uh, for an iGPU, of course. You're mostly only able to play esports titles like Rainbow Six Siege with the 96 EU Iris XE, getting about 69 FPS average on the lower settings with a 1% low of 58 FPS and a 0.1% low of 50 FPS. And that might not sound like much, but again, we haven't really been able to even come close to these numbers with Intel's UHD graphics in the past, so it's definitely impressive to see how far iGPUs have come. You almost are able to play games natively at about 60 fps now. Temperatures however spiked quite high during this benchmark and it didn't really take long for the system to thermal throttle so that's not really a good sign. When it comes to something a lot heavier like Shadow of the Tomb Raider however to be honest with something like this you're perfectly fine with a uh, over 30 fps experience it's not ideal but you know what Console gamers have been doing it for decades, am I right? To that end, the 96 EU Iris XE inside the laptop pulled a respectable 37 average FPS on low with the 1% being 28 FPS and the 0.1% brought down to 15 FPS because of the loading screens, otherwise the gameplay was perfectly acceptable at above 30 FPS. Surprisingly, the temperatures were much lower than when playing Rainbow Six Siege and this may be because Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a more GPU intensive game. Arguably the more interesting part of the new XE GPU is its uh, hardware video encode and decode abilities as Intel did make quite a few big claims about it and in theory this should make it perfect for video editors on the go and so I edited and rendered out my past video on it, well one of my past videos on it in DaVinci Resolve. In terms of editing, the XE graphics wasn't really helpful as I still couldn't really live preview my clips with uh, effects on them but in terms of export, I felt that it really did help a little. I exported in native, which is software encoding, Intel's QuickSync and NVENC on my 1080Ti, and then compared it with my desktop Ryzen 7 3700X on native software encoding. The results are definitely interesting, but it's also not really surprising with the native rendering on the 1165G7 coming in last in terms of time at over 7 minutes and 30 seconds. 
Relegating rendering to the new XE graphics sped up the rendering time considerably at 4 minutes and 21 seconds, bringing it closer to the speed of my 3700X, but at the cost of output file size being almost 3 times larger. On that note of screen recording, I had problems in OBS recording the in-game samples that you saw previously in the game test using QuickSync. Video recordings, the moment that any game started benchmarkings would end up like a slideshow, rendering them unusable and while switching to software was a lot better, this also exhibited some stuttering and was unusable. In the end, I resorted to using Intel's graphics command center to do the screen recordings while gaming, though I did notice some drop frames and also sacrifices on quality. During those gaming sessions, while the components inside the laptop got quite hot and you can definitely feel it in the area above the keyboard and below the laptop, usage within the keyboard area still remained quite comfortable, maxing out at 38 degrees Celsius in a 30 degree room. Noise levels weren't too bad either, definitely audible but not terrible. I was also pleasantly surprised with the speaker performance of this laptop, but that's it, it does come with a caveat. Being bottom firing speakers, they do sound better when placed on a hard surface like a table, not so much if you're using it on a uh, bed or on your lap. Still, they can get quite loud and have a decent amount of clarity, though as expected, bass isn't great, but it isn't terrible either. Getting into the battery life, I gotta say that I had high expectations of this laptop, but I found that the results were a bit mixed. See, if you're not doing much on it, the laptop can last for quite some time while idling, but the moment that I exerted on it my battery draining workload of listening to music on YouTube and writing this script on Google Docs, I only got about 6 hours and 30 minutes. This means that it has a much lower endurance than the original Ionic 14 and 15 that I looked at before, although those laptops do have the upper hand with a larger battery capacity, and this chip has a higher TDP as well. Um, speaking of charging and batteries, charging it back up takes about 2 hours and 30 minutes to full. Right, so I think I've pretty much hit the end of this review, so let's sum things up on the Illigir Ionic Touch, aka Intel NUC M15. At nearly about 5,700 ringgit or 1,373 US dollars, it's definitely not a cheap machine, but at the same time, I believe that a machine like this is more like a boutique machine, as someone buying this is not just interested in getting performance, but also a machine that looks and feels good. That said, I believe that the competition for this machine are laptops like the Dell XPS 15, the MacBook Pros, the Microsoft Surfaces, and the HP Spectres. Almost all of these are also more expensive than this machine and not only that have some form of trade-off versus this, like a smaller display, less RAM, less storage, you name it. That's where I feel this laptop comes in at a very competitive price for its offering. It's not perfect of course as you still have to deal with that crappy camera, the battery life at least for me honestly could have been better in my opinion, and of course the early adopter issues like I pointed out uh, before in the video like video playback, screen recording issues and whatnot, but again the same could be said for those other machines too because <laughs> guess what, they too run the same 1165 G7 and Intel XE graphics. To no obvious extent then I feel that those bugs will be ironed out in time and so if you can wait for that to happen or decide to get this laptop once they're all fixed and dealt with, then yeah, I feel that the Intel NUC M15 and by extension any laptops based off this design like the Illigir Ionic Touch are pretty appealing for the money and are good and cheap white label alternatives to the big named brand offerings. Recommended if you're looking for a capable XPS MacBook Lite laptop without breaking the bank. That's it. That's the end of the review. If you'd like to get one for yourself, you can check out their website 
uh, that I will link down in the description below. If you like this video, well, giving it a uh, like, sharing it and commenting down below really helps my channel. Uh, the way YouTube does their analytics and discovery and things, you know. <laughs> and of course, consider subscribing to me if you like my work and would like to see more. And uh, oh, if you're already subscribed, thank you. But also don't forget to hit the bell icon to get notified for any of my future videos. My name is Yang, the tech rodent. And yeah, I don't know. This was kind of fun. Let me know if you guys would like... Wait, let me know what you guys uh, would like me to review and cover. I will see you guys in the next video. Yeah. Gosh, forgetting my lines. YouTube is hard. <laughs> I'll see you guys.